Hey guys, welcome. My name is Ram. And I'm Bhargav. And welcome to Data Shots from Resonant. And this is our third installment for this year. And uh, today, what we're going to talk about as our recommendation for early stage brands to drive some really kick ass marketing for 2021 is to understand and implement the nuances and the technology and the data necessary for what we call the brand Doppler effect. Okay, so we're gonna talk about that. I know it's a new term, but you'll be able to understand exactly what we're talking about. And Bardo and I will explain to you exactly what it is all about. But let me just set up with a little bit of a context. Okay, we all understand that we spend a whole lot of money, 20 to 30% of, of our budgets, especially if you're an early stage brand, to drive your outbound marketing, okay? So pretty much a whole lot of money goes out into driving just pure, letting people know we exist, letting people know the offers that we have. It's purely about outbound marketing. Now, did you know that every day there is $100 million wasted in ad waste, okay? By the way, that's a whole lot of money, okay? Right. Like, just imagine, right? By the time we get done with this little data shot episode, there'll be at least $4 million wasted of people spending money on trying to get their message across, across these platforms, okay? Why does that happen? Because of the fact that it just sends out, there are several technical reasons for it. There are several platform reasons for it. But one of the main reasons it happens is because people are just basically sending out these messages out into ether and it just goes out to nowhere, okay? So one of the challenges that we have is to figure out how do we actually make effective use of our advertising so that we can actually get resonance from our clients, from our uh, customers. But more important than resonance, especially if you are a early stage brand, one of the most important things that you can you know, focus on is to figure out how influential is your messaging that actually gives you any kind of response from your audiences, okay? So what I wanted to, what we wanted to talk to you about today is to understand the fact that there is something called a Doppler effect that exists with respect to marketing communications. And it really determines how influential your drive towards connecting with your audiences are. And it also helps you to understand what we call the return on influence. Okay, so let me pass it on to Bhargava to share with you. I know I've loaded you guys with a lot of uh, information in the beginning. So Bhargava, take it from here. Okay, so uh, fascinating, uh, fascinating use of the word return on influence. Uh, but let me ask you this question. You, uh, you used this two, three times already on having influential effect of the marketing spend. Uh, but any, any marketer who's out there already know that they need to measure what's happening. Marketing effectiveness is like, it, that dashboard exists on, on the laptop of any marketer. Yeah. So where is this coming from? What do you mean by influential versus something that's already done in the marketing effectiveness space? That's a great question, Bhargava. So we all talk about ROI and obviously we touched upon something uh, on return of insights yesterday, which you actually brought up and you actually shared. Yeah. But the insights, the return on insights are the seeds of figuring out what kind of insights are needed to drive the stories that we want to say, what brands want to say. And why are we telling these stories? We are telling these stories because we can reach out to audiences in this ether, okay? And affect the right kind of influence, both from a behavioral point of view and also from a psychographic point of view so that our audiences can respond to us favorably, okay? This, is sort of a science and an art together. Let me also paraphrase by saying that we're not talking about influencer marketing. That's not what we're talking about. 
Okay, we are talking about brand influence. Incidentally, just to give you a backstory, the return on influence as a as a jargon or a metric or whatever you want. To, I think it's a metric. It's it's a metric that's very important. It was first of all the very first time I came across, and that's also something which people can Google. Uh, is by this lady by the name of Amy Jo Martin, and uh, she was the uh, head of social and data for the Phoenix Suns, and she came up with this social metric called the return of influence back in 2011. That seems like I don't know three lifetimes ago. I don't know. I feel so old. I feel so old. Yeah. So what? ROI from a return on influence point of view is literally about devising ways as a marketer to say how much of an influence, both from a KP, hardcore API, you know, KPI point of view, as well as from a brand resonance, brand affinity, brand love, and how much of a propagation effect does my messaging have? What kind of influence does it have on the people that I'm trying to connect with? Does it have a positive influence or does it have a negative influence? What is the delta? These are things which are now measurable. It might not have been measurable earlier, but now we have the tools and the data and the listening opportunities and the ways to actually listen. And that is why it is absolutely critical for any CMO to have this as one of the key elements of their brand growth strategy. Does that uh, answer your question? Oh, absolutely. So the so way I hear then is that there should be some team that the brand should have, that they should be able to tell to uh, their consumers, right? So, how, would, so what, what, how do you think about framing the team as part of your influence yeah, I think so we're all trying to, even, even this conversation, Bhargavad, this is our theme is, you know, our theme is to empower growth brands, okay? So that's what we are passionate about, okay? Uh, so we are going through this process of how do we actually serve our clients, right? So that is, this is, this is our medium of influence. We are trying to build this out so that we bring together the wisdom that we know so that we can serve our customers, whoever who is going to watch this at any point in time. I believe, and I think, you know, smart marketers understand that any brand that has actually built a real tribe, a real powerful brand, always works on a methodology, okay? So obviously I, each brand has a nuanced uh, you know, way to do it, but, at a very, very broad level, everything starts with a theme, just like what you pointed out, okay? And that theme is something which is rooted in the brand's truth. What exactly does the brand exist about? What, is, what do they want to talk about? Uh, so you start with a theme, for example, uh, let's take, uh, what's, a good, uh, what's a good brand? All birds, okay? All birds is a very, very good brand. Yes. Now, all words theme is uh, comfortable, sustainable footwear, or actually maybe it's sustainable, comfortable footwear. Now, if you take if you take the footwear out, okay, which is because that's where the domain that they are actually playing in, because Nike is also there, Adidas is also there, pretty much Payless shoe source is there. So, footwear is a category, which means that. Their theme that they're gonna like, they, they, they drive, they, that's the bedrock of their influential influence strategy is comfortable sustainability or sustainable comfortability. Okay? So, and anything and everything that they do comes from that, right? So that's why, and I think any brand, whether you're a B2B brand or a B2C brand, it doesn't really matter. I believe that everyone has a theme. And I think from, you know, you take the right and the left brain together of your teams and figure out what is my brand's theme. And once you have that, then comes the next step, which is where the data comes in to figure out, you know, what can we discern? What can we say based on these things? And I think that's where somebody like you will come in and basically say, this is where you actually look into. 
Right. So, so this is fascinating, right? Because one of the things that the reason I was asking a lot of marketing effectiveness has been that things that really a lot of marketers and data analysts who work with the marketers talk about are page views, impressions, click-through rates. Yeah. I mean, these are these are really hardcore metrics, and I understand why this was needed because you need to you need to use these to make budget allocations. You need to justify why you've done something like this. But this is also, if you think about it, this is a purely a point in time effect. What you need if you're going to really build a brand is to have a strategy in place to build the flywheel effect. You're you're there somewhere right now. But can you use, so there's only so much that performance marketing can take you. That yep. market is getting commoditized, but if you can do it, so can all your competitors. The only difference that you have is you, right? And how can you use that, like what you talked about the team and build the flywheel effect. To do that, how can you go from metrics that were typically used to the metrics that can measure these influence? Virality, sentiment, affinity. As you pointed out sometime earlier, these were metrics that were probably very vague, hard to even define 10 yeah. years back in this day and age with the kind of technology and tools that we have access to. These are well within our reach. And these are the kind of stuff that a brand should be looking to measure to get to the next level. And this would mean one, define these metrics and what it means for them, right? These are not going to be a point in time. These are going to be evolving. But also the second thing is to have the techniques in place, both from a data perspective and from a methodology perspective. So yeah. not necessarily perspective, data and, data and techniques to get them to measure and report these activities. And this could, a simple way to think about is, is what I would say, right? So consider every interaction that you have with customers like a graph. You have nodes and you have edges. So brand is one node and so are each of the customers so are your retail partners. And there's an edge, a connection between each one of them. Uh, some connections exist, some connections don't, some connections yeah. are strong, some connections are weak. So can you use these things? Can you model your mechanism in a graph way? And then can you use these to measure virality? So what's virality? It's just diffusion. Like if you tell, if you tell this message, how does this spread in your graph? That's your network. It will help you identify yeah. your tribe, the part where what your tribe takes, what the part that your consumers are looking to be taken into and can help you do things which was not possible before. The third aspect that I would say, so, so obviously one, one that I told was KPI, the second is say uh, tools and techniques, which is graph. The third I would say is, uh, is really use unstructured data to your advantage, especially if you're an early stage brand. Oh, this is like the day, number of data points that you have is too low and you can use these to some. Yeah, so you want to know what an unstructured data is. What is an unstructured data for the common man? Okay, so, so you see, okay, so so customer X bought, yeah, say a product on your site. So you you sell shoes. So a shoe on your site uh, at this time for this price. So this data that you see, which is typically what you would see in an Excel sheet, to yeah, is a tabular data. It's structured. You know what each column means, and there is a structure to it. So. This column, column A means the product, the SKU, product B means the, the column B is the price that you're referring to. Unstructured data on the other hand are, are things which are, our conversation is quite unstructured, right? So the way we talk, customer yeah. leaves a feedback, they send an email, they leave a trail of logs, like these yeah. are breadcrumbs all over the place, right? So can you use this information to your advantage? So that's what unstructured. unstructured can be textual or it can be voice. So they have a phone call. It can yeah. be visual, right? So they, they post a picture on their social feed, being Instagram or Facebook. So there's all these or on your on your uh, brand page. All of these yeah. things are information about are information which 
doesn't follow any structure. So there's some information that they have posted. Uh, there's a healthy amount of noise too, but can you yeah, listen, right. identify those signals to take uh, some insight? I'll, I'll give you a fascinating example, something that I came up with, but, but this is more uh, a context of uh, Indian cooking. So uh, Indian cooking, while well, it's known for its spices, it's also quite messy when you cook, right? Because there's like all these things that are out there. You need a lot of things. Okay, so I think you've touched upon the, the greatest example of unstructured data ever. You know, because the Indian cooking is all unstructured data which creates magic at the very end of it. I know, I know. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the output, the flavor, it's all awesome. But one of the important things that goes into a lot of these cooking is the yeah. blender. A blender right like it's a high grade blender that every indian kitchen has and uh, there was this this company which was trying to create its private label and they were going through all their logs of data to find what was happening like what's what like they, they want to launch a new private label uh, food blender and they were like okay what should be the differentiator and everyone the customers were just telling that okay the length of the wire is not long enough, okay? And this, this was like stumping them. I'm like, every kitchen has this electrical socket. Why is the length of the wire not long not enough? Long enough. Okay. So if you've ever seen, if you've ever used a foot blender, you know that all these things have really short length. And why is the length yeah. of the foot blender matter to these people? It length. So this is the first order reaction, right? It leads to the second order thing where they started doing customer research, started reading more articles around what customers are saying. Yeah. There's all these Indian spices like turmeric and stuff like that. They leave this mark on the wire. So cleaning the blender after cooking was such a painful task. So you literally have to oh take it and go and yeah. keep it somewhere. So then the new thing that came up, the private label that was launched was just something which was in yellow color, some some color which was long the color of the spices, which you are just went against the whole problem and the entire. Yeah, I got you. Right. That's so, awesome. So this, this is like an example of where, as a new growth stage brand, you can use unstructured data. Need not be. I mean, it, this these are information that are available in public. You can just go check all your yeah. competitors' reviews are, and then as you start doing your product development, as you start doing your marketing differentiation, like one of the parts of the theme that you talked about, these are things that you should really use to your advantage. And these can only come if you can blend one, understanding how you can build a brand your influence with data to drive that flywheel effect. I think what you're talking about, we should actually, it's really not just a flywheel effect. I, I think what you're really saying is rooted in the whole idea of the Doppler effect. Okay, which is what uh -huh. we started the discussion with. Right. The way that I see what you've done, which is precisely what we want to share with our audiences, is that there is such a thing called a brand drop. Okay. What that means is that while we have understood the theme in this case, let's look at the theme of the Indian uh, the, the blender thing, right? It's basically like uh, clean convenience. Let's just talk, you know, look at it as a theme, right? So we just like clean, whatever cleaning, and then convenience is whatever you want convenience and clean performance maybe. That'd be a better way of actually saying that because Blender needs to perform and it needs to work. the cleaning is a big problem. So it's the cleanest performance or like most performing clean, whatever, right? Which means that the theme is there. When you communicate out, okay, it literally is like a Doppler effect. So you're basically sending out these signals to as many people as possible outside. If you look at a, you ever seen like a, you know, weather forecast in any, you know, local television anywhere in the US, there's literally it's a Doppler effect. So what happens in a Doppler is that the signals go out and it hits the moisture, whatever cloud or rain or snow or sleet or whatever, and it picks back the reflection of the, you know, the uh, frequency or the, you know, the signal. And that reflection is what is actually shown there. That's just the way a sonar works. That's the way a dolphin works. And frankly speaking, subconsciously, that's the way humans work too, okay? When a signal comes towards us, which is resonant, which is aligned with what our problem areas are, what our needs are, 
in this case, which Indian housewife or any, I don't want to be gender split, you want to be gender neutral, which Indian person would not want to have a clean blender? It resonates with me because somebody's going to look at it and say, they thought of this, they've solved a problem. I know that every blender needs good performance, but it is easier to clean. It's what happens after the blender use, it's like all the cleaning, it's one step lesser. That is a signal. Somebody looked into it, somebody discerned it. It might not come from a structured data. Okay, it's not like it's in a transactive, uh, you know, new website where somebody's going to show that. As you rightly pointed out, it is literally discerning from unstructured data. It would be smart for brands to basically look at it and say, okay, let me understand my theme. Let me understand what is the kind of data that I want, where I want to look at. And let me send out these signals. Let me find out what kind of signals I'm getting back from my audience. There are two advantages that's going to happen. If you just look at a Doppler, it's not like, you know, you'll be able to see where the clouds are and which way the wind blows, right? The same way when you send out thinking along the lines of, okay, I'm going to use this kind of an analogy and send out my campaigns throughout the ether, you would be able to using the, you know, the right kind of data discerning tools, you'll be able to see which segment of audiences are more resonant with my messaging, who are more aligned with, who are basically giving me signals back. It can be a positive signal or a negative signal. A signal back is a good signal, right? And then the more and more you influence and drive that you know, messaging, your frequency and the intensity and the influence increases, which means that you're gonna get closer and closer and closer with what the audiences are looking for. And then there is this resonance that happens which is literally what a brand uh, Doppler effect is. And I feel that when you talk about, you know, driving through creating a theme and figuring out how do we want to structure the data, where do you want to find the data and driving campaigns, I feel that it's absolutely critical for brands to think along the lines of like, okay, I have a set of data with me. I also have opportunities to discern data from outside from unstructured data. But what am I going to do with this? I'm going to basically bring it together, root it on the theme that I have for my brand and think along the lines of like, let me optimize for, you know, where, the, where is the best signals that I can send to and where is the best signals that I'm coming back, what, what I'm getting back. Yeah, does that bring it all together? Absolutely, absolutely. I think Doppler effect is such a great explanation of what the brand should be looking at, right? Because signals, it's not just, it's no longer monologue, it's dialogue. And if yeah. you can understand and what the brands and consumers are sending signals all the time. Okay, so can you turn to a frequency where you can maximize your brand's effectiveness, your brand's messaging reach to the right set of audience who would take you along to your next step, the extremely not just yours, but also take the consumers along with them, right? So that's extremely important. Yeah, I think it's the whole two-way effect that is coming together, right? So right. one of the things which we want to leave behind very, very clearly today, my dear, dear, dear CMOs, is that today we have the opportunity to discern this data, okay? We have the capability to not just look at what kind of signals are needed to be sent out based on the themes. It might not just be, it might be, let me also be very, very clear. And I think Bhargav will also agree with me that it's not like you have to have only one theme. You might have to have one theme. And on top of that, you can have multiple themes based on that so that you can actually for, you know, wherever your audience is in your, in their journey, we call it the trial to trial journey. It might be different. You know, the signals that you need to send out might be different, but start with the theme. Okay, start with the theme and then build on top of it so that you can identify this is the theme that I want to drive. This is the kind of influence I want to exert so that these are the kind of data points that I need to look into and then make the doctor effect happen. And I think it's completely doable. Absolutely. 
it's while you might be aiming to get a million people who like your brand you need to find those thousand people who love your brand and can do whatever they can do in their limits. yeah it's easy to reach it's easy you're right it's easy to reach a thousand a million people it's much more harder to reach a thousand people who love you very true it's like dating yes. it's like dating you know <laughs> I mean, yeah, really th think about it. Right? You're basically on a date, right? Like a little mini, you know, date. Like you're like, hey, you know what? This is me. And the consumer says, oh, I like you. Let's, yeah, let's talk, you know? True. Yeah. 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 You would rather actually sit on a very nice date rather than like saying like, okay, I guess we can, that's a completely different conversation. Yeah. Let me just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, so get people to understand and identify your return on influence. I think if, if this one key takeaway is, is that have return on influence as one of your KPIs. And I think it should be a very, very primary KPI for 2021 and beyond. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. yesterday we covered the whole idea of like the demise of the third party cookie, which means your right. first party data is absolutely critical, which literally means that Mm -hmm. people need to be gravitating towards what you are, where you are, and how you want them to actually gravitate towards, which is a direct result of influence. Absolutely. So how influential you are. And if you can get yourself in this frame of mind, which I think most of the you know, brands are going towards, then all you really need to do is to figure out, okay, what are the actual tactical data capabilities that I need to implement so that I can discern from my own structured unstructured data sources to drive the signals that will actually maximize my return on influence. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the result of it is a beautiful Doppler effect. Okay. So let's cap it right there, Bhagavad. What do you say? Awesome, sure. Sounds good. Doctor okay. reflected. Thank you. And if you guys need any, if you have any questions, hit us up. Uh, visit us at www.resonance.agency or follow us on our Twitter and Instagram. And uh, until next time, thank you guys and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you.